Hey everybody. Um, thanks, Alan. Th thank you for inviting me. Um, really appreciate coming out here. All right. Um, so this presentation is called Kata. So you will see no product presentations in this presentation. Um, it's really about culture, but um, but more importantly, we use the word culture quite often, and um, and really culture is like the highest aggregate level of the things we really want to do. Um, so, so for those who don't know kata, right, it's a Japanese term. Um, basically, it's a form of kind of repetitive movements to try to create habits that ultimately become autonomic or memory muscle, right? Um, commonly used uh, for things like karate or kabuki theater. Um, so my name is John Willis. I uh, go by the... Um, uh, Twitter handle of Botch Glue. I, I do have the slides for this, and I, I've actually started getting organized late in my life. I have all my presentations for the last six years actually in a GIS file. But if you know, if you want to, it's U Z I B E. If you remember Audi or W L Y, um, it has this presentation. And um, if we get the video up, I'll also put the video link there too. But I've done this presentation in different forms. Lots of things I've done. Thirty-five years. I was fortunate enough to. Uh, be an early cloud evangelist for Canonical, the Ubuntu folk. I actually was early in at Optical Chef, had an amazing experience there, um, helped uh, kind of define the customer facing business there. Um, the last couple of years, uh, the startup gods, I've done a lot of failed startups. Um, I've had actually two reasonably good exits in the last three years. One company we sold to Dell, probably heard of those guys, and then um, uh, nine months ago, I sold a company to a company you've probably never heard of called Docker. Um, and uh, anyway, I'm a DevOps core organizer. I've been to 35 official DevOps. Actually, in the early days in LA, they used to have DevOps Day. And I actually, I could add 10 of those to the list, guys like Brandon. And we still run these things more than almost any other city. I have a DevOps Cafe. I don't make any money off it. I would recommend doing it because some of the people I'm going to talk about in here and things that we've talked about, we've interviewed those people. It's a lot of fun. I'm also a core organizer of the Enterprise Summit. Um, so, in 2013, all right, we're going to see how this works. Did not work well in Berlin. Um, in 2013, Bethany Marcy gave a presentation about blameless postmortems and a tool that she used. Right, so if you haven't followed the whole thing about blamelessness and post it's a big part of that. Uh, lots of other presentations on that. She was asked a question, I think 2740, it was near the end, and I'm, I, I'm just gonna play, hopefully, the audio works, I'm just gonna play the question and her answer. How do we ensure that the remediation item is assigned during the post actually get done? I have no idea how to answer that. I cannot imagine being assigned a ticket for a postmortem and not doing it. I, that, I've never heard of that happening. So I guess it's just that it's personal responsibility and we just get sh shit done. I don't have an answer for you, I'm sorry. I, I've been assigned a thing, remediation items for a postmortem and like it would literally never occur to me not to do it. So, so like if, you, if you didn't catch that, you know, it seems funny, right? But um, you know, the, the person was asking, you know, oh, hey, you know, we have people um, that don't follow up on there. And, and she didn't understand the question, <laughs> right? And, and um, she said, I don't have no idea how to answer that question. Lily would never occur to me. And what's interesting is that's kata, by the way. If you're looking for what kata is, it's an autonomic behavior pattern, hopefully a positive one for your organization. And um, so in the early days when, um, I'm gonna talk a lot about um, Japan culture, Toyota. And in the early days, um, after the US car makers started realizing they were being decimated by uh, Japanese automakers, they started sending people over there. Ironically, in the 60s and 70s, the Japanese sent people over to America to figure out how to do it. And then they started going back and saying, why are we getting crushed? And, and, and um, they would ask these questions that would seem like absolutely simple questions to the line workers. And the line workers had no idea what they're talking about. 
famous story was two, uh, I think it was General Motors workers were, were sitting on a line in Toyota City at a plant. And they were watching the door fitter put the doors in. And not once, from their perspective, they were like, okay, I've had enough. How come you don't have to use a mallet, rubber mallet, to fit the door in? And then, um, I'm embellishing this. Then this 45 minutes to an hour discussion goes on. What's a mallet? Why would you hit a door with a hammer? And, 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 and it goes on and on. And finally, the, the, the line worker in the Toyota plant says, oh, I know what you're saying. Just like that. I get it. I get it. Now I understand the question. It was that, no, oh, no, 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 no. If you think about fitting the door, that's solved back in design. We, and, and, and an author I'm going to talk about a little bit talks about how there was this, always this mismatch. They were to go and ask what they thought were simple questions. And, and not because the, the Toyota workers were trying to, to obfuscate their answers. They just didn't understand the questions. So Aristotle says, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. So, um, Bethany works for Etsy. Etsy is, is a poster child for a company that does a lot of things right in what we kind of call this DevOps thing. If you want to read, their code is craft. They have culture bleeding through. John Ospar has um, a blog site. So he's, he's a leader, lead, you know, we hate to use the word thought leaders, but sometimes we just don't know a better way to describe somebody. John is a thought leader on amazing topics. Blame is much more of safety culture. Interesting. But this is not a story about Etsy. It's a story about Toyota and what Toyota, how they influence. So, in 1958, and I apologize for the people, I, I steal really good stuff from great speakers and then I give attribution. So Steven Spears at DevOps Enterprise covered some of this. I think I'm going to do a better job. <laughs> so in 1958, this Toyo pet thing was the first, car, first Japanese car they tried to introduce in the U.S. By all accounts, I was born in 1959, so I didn't drive one. But all accounts, it was a piece of shit. Right? Um, and by the way, at the time, it, for, for, to make this car in America, the, the similar type non-piece of shit version, or maybe just a little less shittier um, version is um, it took basically um, 32 workers to make this car to, every, to four people to make the comparable car in the US. Okay. I'll talk about somebody who influenced a lot of thinking in Japan a little bit later in this presentation, but leave that as a placeholder. In 1968, they introduced the Corolla. So this is a story, a lot of people talk about disruption. In fact, I'm getting into a fight this morning with Joe Wyman on Twitter about Clayton Christensen's uh, recent um, article where he said, this is why I always run out of time, he basically was arguing, Clayton Christensen, right, claimed that Uber is not a disruptor. And I agree with him. Uber is a decimator. Toyota, it was a decimator. This is a story of decimation. Okay, um, so in 1968, they introduced this car, and here's the thing, Spears said this, and now I was kind of alive at this point. Still only 10 years old, 9 years old, but kind of understood the whole car and gas thing and all that. And, and um, when you got into the 70s, so first off, this became the second imported car. It was actually the first kind of car that actually had what they called affordable quality. You actually got quality from a car that cost less than the, car, the, than the cars that were bad quality. Um, they actually um, went ahead and um, this became a second importer. But by the time you hit the 70s, late middle 70s, I, I started driving probably around 74, 75. And I remember Spears saying this in the DevOps, Steven Spears, an author. He, he talked about how, you know, for the first time, if you bought a car, you didn't have to find a guaranteed mechanic. American cars, even new cars, in the late, mid to late 70s, even early 80s, you know, it's like you need a doctor, like I have to have a doctor. You had to have a mechanic, even if it was new. And Spear says, for the first time, you, all you needed was gas. Imagine that. And then they ravaged the industry all the way up to their brazenness in 1989 to say, 
You know what? We're going to try to get into the luxury car. Are you kidding me? Toyota, that company that used to make those horrible, you know, um, Toyota pets. In less than a in less than a decade, they owned the luxury car. They passed um, Cadillac, BMC, BMW, BMC, BMW, and um, Mercedes. And here's where the story gets really easy. I mean, again, they're just owning. Oh, by the way, by the time they got to 1968, you know how many people it took to get to the four people to make a car, a barrel of car? Two. So they, they could make a car with two people to America making every car of a comparable number with four. They cut everything in half. By the time they get to the 2000, this is where the story gets amazing, right? And if they get to 2000, everybody, Ford, Chrysler, General Motors, they all see the same problem, hybrid cars. They all start with their own scientists and engineers trying to figure this problem at the same time. There's a whole book written around it. It's called Toyota Supply Chain. It's a great book. I will tell you, the, and that net is, by 2015, the uh, Prius has 65% of the market. And by the way, in general, in general, Toyota in general can make a car anywhere from two to three times less than cost than any American car. Now, Toyota's had some problems in the, in, in, in the last couple of years, and I, we, that could be another presentation. But certainly from about 1970 to 2010, this was a, 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 a market that was decimated. And so I read this book this summer, and you know, people say a book changed your life, and I recommend this book, and they tell me, John, it's changed my life. My wife and my kids, they changed my life. Books usually don't change my life. This is a great book. Mike Rother talks about the invisible side and he says, he starts the book pretty much says there's been a hundred books written about lean and Toyota and, uh, and basically none of them talk about the invisible side of what happened there. Now how do you decimate some of these great presentations this morning, right? Like culture, I was culture. But you want to learn how to decimate a market? Pay attention. Read this book. So Mike Roth says in page 262, Spanish 50, Toyota is not a story about techniques and an organization defined primarily by unique behavior of teams that can to teach to all its members. There was um, another, a great Harvard Business Review paper uh, back in the 90s, um, maybe, yeah, maybe late 90s, called Decoding the DNA of Toyota Parcel System. And there's a quote in there that I love that says, Toyota was a community of scientists continually experimenting. So everybody in Toyota behaved like a scientist. Everything they did was an experiment. In fact, um, they, they, they kind of got lucky because they had some culture right from the get-go. They were originally not a car manufacturing company. Maybe actually, they actually built fabrics and looms. And uh, the original founder, Sayoshi Toyota, created this idea of Jodoka. And he had these looms with hundreds, maybe, I don't know, lots of needles. And the needle would break and fabric would finish, and at the end they'd find there were knots in the fabric and they'd have to throw it away. And so he invented this, basically the original inventor of stop the line. Break the build. Right? Um, he actually sold the patent, raised enough money um, so that, in fact, one of the things I think is interesting, this is in uh, Steven Spears books, so I'll talk about in a minute, said that the interesting thing is, in the Toyota Museum, the centerpiece of the museum is the loom that he couldn't get to work. Not the one he got to work, the one he couldn't get to work. It tells you something about a culture that embraces value. So um, his son starts um, Toyota, Motor, Toyota Motor Corporation. One point, very early on. This is before their transformation, but they had these like, little kind of beauty insights, like being ready to be a decimator. Um, he was asked about, um, some, some people stole plant designs or machine designs. And he said, oh no, no don't worry, folks. He said, you know, we improve our process every day. By the time the thieves produce that machine, we will have it advanced well beyond that point. Now, the father of Toyota Production Systems, oh, by the way, you know, if you want to take the reverse history here, DevOps comes from Lean, Agile, goes back to, to Toyota. Lean comes from Toyota Production Systems. I will tell you in a few minutes that all of that comes from Deming, but I get ahead of myself. Toyota Ono was asked, um, why, at that point where they let all the Americans come over and, and look at what they were doing, 
there are people that work with them like, why are we doing this? Why are we letting them copy us? And, and, and I've read a fair amount about this, this man, and he was very patriotic, and he was, um, and, and um, almost to the point where like, he knew everything that was going on. And he, I could almost, I add to this story my own little uh, added sauce in that. I could see him snickering and saying, they can copy our process, but they can't copy our culture. And the truth was, they couldn't even see their cop. And he knew that. Um, and so what is kata? Like we call it culture. Um, I, I've been, me and my uh, Dallas Cafe co-host, uh, Damon Edwards, we've been credited with these, the creation of an acronym called CAMS, Culture Automation Measurement Sharing. Uh, but the truth is, culture is just a nice banner word. Like there's a lot of people will tell you you can't change culture, you have to look at behavior. How do you change behavior? You have to change habits. So, all right, we start with habits. If they're good habits, we try to make them autonomic, like Bethany. Bethany couldn't understand that question. That's so, well, imagine being at Etsy and like the idea of like, whoa, whoa, nobody at Etsy for 10 years, whatever. I, I, I can't even imagine that scenario. Of somebody not following up on an action item in a post -mortem. Right, um, so these are the invisible things. They, they can be autonomic. These become autonomic. Um, See Mustafa come to the stage, I get worried. Oh, front and center. All right, I might be in trouble. All right, um, but then there's the visible side if you know what you're looking for. All right, this is a story. Like, do you want to decimate a market? Pay attention. I mean, it's, it's not me. There's people who have, have told us how to do this. I'm just repeating what they've told us. They embrace scientific method. They act like scientists. In fact. You won't hear every organization that, you know, I can list five or six companies that I adore in DevOps. And I would tell you, they might not say they're not scientists, but they act like scientists. You'll see why. They certainly, almost all, depersonalize it. They think systems thinking. They want non-blameful environments. They embrace non-deterministic thinking. They don't, they are not arrogant to think that somebody can just hit a button and it will control the complexity of it. Non-determinism means complexity. They understand these environments are complex environments. And you not deterministically model complex environments. We we'll spend another 40 minutes on things like Kinevin and really fun stuff about complexity. Uh, so I, I um, we, we were talking earlier about this gentleman, Ben Rockwood, who works over at Opsco Chef. I have to call it Opsco, but it's called Chef now. Um, the, um, he turned me on to Deming, and he, you know, he, told, he basically made this quote, John, it all starts with Deming. No, come on, really? Read the books, buddy. And I read the books. And, uh, and again, I've done a lot of presentations on Deming, so again, the reason I put that link is yeah, partially from where you go, but mostly for if you want to learn more about these subjects. I only have 45 minutes, so I can do 45, I can do an hour on Demi. But three things that Demi talked about. Now, Demi talked about this stuff 50 years ago. Go, you know, if you don't believe me, go, not right now, but Google Deming's 14 points. And if you've seen any DevOps presentation in the last two years, you'll go, oh my God, I saw that in such and such. A I saw that one in such and such. A but Demi basically kind of had three pillars in the way he thought. One was he had this thing that was coined plan, do, check, act. He actually, um, like me, took it from somebody else with attribution, uh, Walter Stewart. Uh, but it's, it's what they call the Deming cycle. And that's scientific method, folks. It, it's, it, it, in fact, it became Six Sigma. Don't blame him for Six Sigma. But, um, but the, um, the, the point is that and here's the thing, like, I, I'm just reading a book by uh, Jim Womack right now, and, and I'll talk about Jim Womack in a little bit. He was the guy that coined Lean, actually. And he says, like, we're really good. And even all those Lean experts that he's been talking to for the last 20 years, 25 years, he runs Lean uh, Enterprise Institute, he says, we're really good at Plan Do, and we suck at Check Act. Right? And Check Act is the scientific method. Like, we plan all day, we can do all day, but do we actually treat it like a science experiment? Do we check the results? And then here's the thing, like if you do everything scientific method, 
There is no such thing as a failure. In fact, Mike Rother, the book, the McCarter book, says that if you look up in the dictionary the word failure, it doesn't say warning, go to the next page. Like, stay off this page. It has the word failure in it. Right? Like, failure is like just the outcome. Work didn't work. Had a theory, tried it, didn't work. What do I do next? I plan, do, check, act. There's all sorts of variations of this. People call them OODA loops. To a certain extent, Kinevin is a massive feedback loop instruction. Um, cybernetics. Interesting. All right. The other thing he was big on is variation. I am big on variation. It doesn't fit as much in this story, but understanding statistical process control variation. Not to be trivialized. But the, the other major point I wanted to make is left side scientists, right side, it's always the system. All right? And, and so Deming used to say many years ago, 94% of all, um, all problems in business systems are basically the system, 6% are people doing it. I would say that Etsy, they would tell you it's 100%. 100% system. Try to get fired, somebody fired at Etsy, really hard job. They will always tell you it's a system. And even if the person like actually went in, hit the button, knocked down the system, trading, um, not, you know, lost $434 million in three hours, company goes out of business in three days, or one day, night capital. Yeah, um, like, a, Deming would still stand up on stage and John Allspar would be right next to him and they would say, it was the system, not the person. It's a hard pill to swallow, but so is DevOps. A thousand deploys in an hour? Out of your mind? I saw that presentation at Velocity four years ago. Amazon basically talked about what they did in a one hour period. All right, so it's always the system. Um, there's a, uh, DevOps, you know, again, I would tell you Deming kind of became the Shakespeare of, of thinking and management. So the short story is, Deming's ideas were rejected for the most part in the U.S. After World War II, he sent over to Japan to help build. Um, you had this culture of already that just fit like a glove. He supposedly was a gentle giant. Um, and basically, people just listened to what he said. They didn't question it. And he, uh, in, Mount, in 1950, he stands in a room like this where he's got 80, 75% of the wealth in Japan. 1950, in the room. And he says, if you listen to what I'm about to tell you, in five years, this country will be prosperous again. And in five years to the date, it was prosperous. In 10 years, they called it the economic miracle. They became second in the world economic profile. You saw what Toyota did, right? And, and so there's some things that I think are interesting. So uh, Jim, James Womack, um, MIT, in the early, late 80s, 90s, start studying academically why, what's going on in Japan, writes this book. Um, I don't think, you know, if you want to read it, great. There's a couple other books I would recommend first. But a couple of things that he, that he talked about and, um, is um, this idea of the Gemba. So the, the, in, in this kind of management flow. So how the Japanese already had a culture of Jadoka, um, bracing failure. Um, they, they thought about like continuous improvement. Demi comes in and just sprays all this system thinking and scientific method, <laughs> peanut butter and chocolate. Um, and um, got one laugh so far. Hey, we're going for it. Hey, a couple more now. Uh, Gemba, uh, the place, the place where things happen. So often we forget the place where things happen. Uh, Jidoka, we talked about that. Like, let's, if something breaks, let's stop it, let's address it now, let's not let it slow down and figure it out when it's already deployed to a billion people. Um, and then um, the Denshi Jubatsu, otherwise called Go See. Um, go See. Go to the Gemba. You, you, by any mean book, you're going to hear some form of Go See, Go to the Gemba. Something happens. Go to it. Don't pick up the call and say, What happened? Yeah, no, 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 no. Okay, you know, we've seen that before. Don't let it happen again. That, that. That was not the way Toyota operated. It was mandatory for them to go see. And then at that point, they thought they went into the scientific method. The Kaizen. They, you know, again, a lot of these words get used different by different authors. 
that most of these authors are academics, and by the way, they don't like sharing stuff. So it's funny, I had a great conversation with Mike Rowland, I had a great conversation with Steven Spears, and the two don't even talk to each other, and they say the same thing in different words. And so you'll hear Kaizen used quite often, but in the, the class of Lean Sense, you'll talk about Kaizen events. What they're saying is PDCA, scientific method. Um, and then Kata is basically, if you can drill this way of thinking into your memory muscle, um, you basically actually start um, creating some patterns of behavior that get you. I haven't told you the whole story yet. So in the Toyota Kata book by Mike Roth, by the way, how many heard, people have heard of value stream mapping? Quite a few. Mike Roth wrote the canonical book on value stream mapping. It was called Learning to See, S-E-E. -E. In fact, the original name of the um, Toyota Kata book was supposed to be Beyond Seeing. But the marketing folk didn't like it. I love it. It was perfect. It's the, the follow-on to learning to see, which is value stream mapping. If you haven't heard about value stream mapping, you should look it up. Great articles. Lots of written about it. So Rafa writes this book about the invisible side of Toyota. And the two things he identifies, pretty much half the book is written about improvement kata, and the other half is coaching kata. So improvement kata is kind of what we talked about. It's the, um, it's the kind of planned use check act. It's, it's scientific method. Um, the coaching kata, which is interesting, in Toyota, everybody had a mentor. There was always a mentor-mentee relationship. And the classic relationship of somebody who was working the line, who basically found something, a judoka, right, was that the, the coach, the responsibility of the coach, would, it was a very learn-by-doing model. The coach would actually go and try to get that person to figure out the problem. And even if the coach knew a better answer, it was better at scalable learning for them to let the mentee or the worker figure the problem out. Right? Again, these things that seem like Western culture counterintuitive. Into it. So if you look at these, are, I, I stole these slides from Mike Rothers. Uh, you can go to his blog site on Toyota Kata. But I love this. And here, one of the things I really love here, oh, and I might need a few minutes. Um, the, here's the, one, here's the one thing I love, like, so Deming talks about something called the AIM. Um, you'll hear Golrat, if you know Ellie Golrat, talk about the goal. Um, you'll hear um, Simon Sinek, if you want to be lucky enough to read, start with why, he talks about the why. But you know, the problem I've always had with all of that, it reminds me of my early days of working at Exxon, when uh, every time one of my managers read a new health, management health book, we see a whole new set of new posters on the wall. Oh, yeah, the pyramid, and oh, the eye, and oh. And I always had a problem with that kind of, and then in, in Roth, and I told Roth, I said, Roth, finally explained to me what I think I didn't get from Deming. You know, Deming, learning Deming is like, a, it's like watching the big Lebowski. If you, every time you watch it, like, oh my god. I, I'm way going off south here, but um, the, um, the, the vision, see, in, 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 in this type of thinking, you're allowed to make an outrageous vision. In fact, Toyota's vision was called one by one flow, one x one. A dream of a day where somebody walks into a dealership, hits a button, and whatever is fast and as humanly possible, or even human and systemly possible, that car came to that person. Pretty much impossible. But that was their vision. And Rothman purposely put a broken arrow there. Because what you were allowed to do in this kind of thinking is have that poster that is basically impossible, but it's, boy, I'd like to be there, a true north. And he calls it a true north. You can have a true north in this model. And it, you know, I, I, the, I used to make fun in the early days, you know, the DevOps was a a, a counterculture, and, and, and you could always spot somebody who had no clue when they said, here at such and such corp, we are gonna have zero defects next year. And you knew like they had no clue of how they were gonna do that. But see, in this model, you can say that. And I'm gonna tell you an amazing ending story of somebody who did this, and never called it Kata, and never called it DevOps. But you, so, what happens is, in this model, you get to have a true north, you're always creating challenges to getting to that point. This is the improvement counter. 
you always are looking at the current condition. And Lean, they'll talk about things like A3. Um, and then you go to, um, you get to the, you're always working towards the next current condition. And that four is the obstacles between the current and, the, and, and that's the PDCA. But the thing, another amazing thing about this book, and there's a lot of amazing things in this book, and again, at this point, you're thinking, like, this guy's boring, and like, you should certainly not read the book. But if at this point you're intrigued, this is a great book. There's another thing he talks about is classic non-deterministic thinking, and he doesn't use that phrase. Because here's the thing, like, that current to target condition, Western culture, deterministic thinking, you know, how, how do we think we can solve that problem? Anybody? Anybody? Googler? Do a checklist. We're going to put 10 items on a list and by golly we'll get to 9 and 10 we're done. And guess what? The world just doesn't work that way. Sorry, bud. Like by the time you get to 2, I mean if you're lucky, 3, everything's changed. The thing you did in the second step changed everything. In the, like this is complexity theory. Butterfly effect. Look it up. So what, what, what Toyota knew 50 years ago, what Deming knew 70 years ago, was what Rafa calls the gray zone. You go into that gray zone knowing, you don't checklist it, you PDCA your way out of it. If you want to oodle loop your way out of it, God bless you. And so this is another slide from Rother. So the, the point is the coaching kata is there's the, 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 the person who's pushing the thing up the, up the hill has all sorts of help, but nobody else is touching that wheel. Right? And, and that was the point. Um, and if you put it all together, in fact, Rother's um, you know, kind of to coaching and improvement, um, you know, there's kind of a planning, you have the learner and coach, or he would call it mentor, mentee, um, you could call it line worker, line manager, right? And, um, and so you had this kind of uh, coaching, Socratic dialogue. I mean, it was a lot of Socratic dialogue. Why do you think it's going to work that way? Well, you know, wait a minute. You've heard of five whys, right? Like that kind of stuff, right? And then the execution was just like pounding out PDCA. In fact, the only two acronyms I think that Rother and both Spears use, I'm going to talk about Spears' book here in a minute, um, they never use the word kata, they don't use any combined words, um, and, but they do both talk about PDCA and Deming. So this is my favorite, so I got two favorite stories. My favorite story for this book, my favorite story for the second book I'm going to talk about. This one should blow your mind. If it doesn't blow your mind, please leave. Go get coffee. See that cord on the top there? This should be easy, but I'm going to ask you. How many people know what that orange and, or yellow and black card is called? What's it called? An Andar card, right. And so in Toyota, basically if you saw something you didn't like, you pulled that cord and you know what it did? It stopped the whole line. And here's the thing. If you pull that cord, remember that coach mentor thing? You know the first thing that the coach said to you? Try this one too. I lost two glasses of scotch, 18 year old scotch on this one, so I'm not giving that away. Free soda. Um, what, did they, what was the first thing they said? Anybody? It's a hard one. Actually, in Berlin, two people got it, and I owed them. Close. That was the second. Well, very end. The first was thank you. Because you've given us a learning opportunity. And even if it was a shadow that looked like a crack, that might be lighting. Another thing that, that Toyota was obsessed with was scale out the learning. So if there was a lamp that pointed at it that looked like a crack and they realized that, oh, thank you, um, they would actually get that scaled out to every plan as, as fast as they could. They were obsessed with learning. But the, to your point, the second thing they would say, which was, but the point thing was, how can I help you fix the problem? But here's the great story in this. In Toyota City, there's a plant, it averages a thousand and on pulls a shift. A thousand stop, a thousand judokas a shift. All of a sudden, they go down to 700. Now, most Western culture organizations would be like, rock and roll, 300 less defects a shift. Um, Toyota plant manager, I don't know if they call them CEOs, but they're the highest level of the plant. 
calls in all hands and says, we've got a problem for this. Down at 1,700, you're all probably saying, what the heck, where is this going? We're learning 300 times left. That's the shift. Like, we are scaled to learn. Again, they didn't look at those as failures. They looked at those as learning opportunities and going from 1,000 to 700 on a consistent, like the chart, 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 bang, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're not as good as we were. No, what are you talking about? 700 defects. No, no, they're not defects. Great story. So I read Toyota, I saw Gene Kim, like so people say don't watch one of my presentations if you don't like to read because you get a lot of books. Well, don't hang out with Gene Kim if you don't like to read because you get a lot of books. Gene Kim told me about Toyota Kata, I read Toyota Kata, I loved it, like, ah, Gene, this is the greatest thing. Oh, 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 calm down, John, read this book next. Um, when I read a book, I'm, I'm not a book, but I, I, I read books, but I'm not like one of those obsessive books. They gotta be great books. Fortunately, Gene was right, this was a great book. In fact, it was the, the, the one-two punch, you wanna read two great books? Again, if you're enthused about what I'm talking about here, read Toyota Kata and read this book immediately after. Steven Spears never talks about anything. He has a bunch of case studies um, related to this whole Kata concept. And so there's the four conditions. Um, I'm not gonna go through them. They're basically the Kata conditions. So I'm gonna play you another video. On the 1st of February, 2003, Columbia began its descent back to Earth. As the shuttle raced over the Pacific towards the US, the crew put on their suits, preparing themselves for a routine landing. It was now 8.40 a.m., and these are pictures of their last moments alive. At 8.44 a.m., Columbia re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. Still, Everything appeared normal. reading from one of the shuttle's many sensors. try to bum you out. But in Steve Spears' book, they didn't act like scientists. Right? Imagine that, NASA. They didn't behave like scientists. Um, so the that misreading they saw, that read or that read, real reading they saw, actually happened on liftoff. There was damage to the thermal left wing thermal panel on liftoff. 24 hours, there was an operational request to go see the problem. Within a 19-day period of that mission, there were eight official requests starting on the first official request started on the fourth. I'm going to need a few minutes. 
um, and um, every time they were rejected. And here's why they were rejected. I have to look at my notes here, so I just get this one. It was called, it's called actually by a sociologist out of Columbia University called um, the uh, normalization of, um, I should have this one down, the normalization of, where is it, of deviance. So what had happened is there had been at least 25 plus times on prior missions where they actually had some form of thermal power damage. And remember that example I said earlier where somebody calls to find out and says, oh, don't worry about it. We've seen it before. As opposed to Toyota. Proceed. Now, I don't know that they would have saved anybody's life, but there were eight official requests. This is in Spears' book. Say, please, can we get them to go out and do an EVA? Um, what, you know, I don't want to say that for years. Um, to um, go out and check and go see the damage. And they didn't do it. Right? And, and they didn't behave like scientists. And, and you know, uh, again, Spears does a great job explaining this. And, you know, and he gives some great examples. In fact, uh, you know, I, I, so the, the Sidney Decker says, Sidney Decker, great safety culture. If you haven't read his books. He says, um, he says, Murphy's Law is a lie. He uh, says, everything that can go wrong will go right. Uh, we talk a lot about near misses. Um, you know, anybody heard, remember the flash crash, 2010? Right? Like, until they put the constraints on after that, some of the research found out how many times that could have happened before. Just near misses. All right, so this is my um, ending story. So I had a favorite story in Toyota Kata, now I got a favorite story in, um, in uh, Spears' book, I Lost the Head. Paul O'Neill gets hired, um, you guys know Paul O'Neill, treasury guy, but before that, he gets hired at Alcola. Alcola at the time had um, industry standard on the job injury of 2%. And what 2% meant was that sometime in your lifetime, you were going to get injured. So Alcola, melting, steel melting, making aluminum, whatever they did, right? Um, there was a, basically you were going to get injured. Um, within short order, he changed that to an industry outstanding, unparalleled, the .007, which meant in your lifetime, you would never meet somebody who got injured. And so what he did, when he got there, the first shareholder meeting, he said, I intend to make Alcoa the safest company in America. I intend to go for zero injuries. You fool. That was a true north. And what he did was, he understood Kata, I never used the word Kata. He understood DevOps, and he never read the word DevOps at this time. And by the way, within short order, they were 5x more profitable. Paul, supposedly, if you invested your money in Alcoa when he got there, you'd double your money by the time you left. He didn't talk about shareholder earnings that I'm going to do. In fact, the analysts hammered him. Like, how do you lie? <coughs> Zero. What, what is he talking about? Like, money. What do you mean? He said, I've got a mandate internally that anytime somebody is injured on the job at Alcoa, I need to know. CEO needs to know about it within 24 hours. He created this reverse learning. I mean, he didn't you do what Rotha was talking about. He didn't do improvement card. He didn't. He basically created a learning organization because everybody had to basically work their way back to him. And it couldn't be a bullshit answer. Like the CEO is saying, hey, folks, 24 hours, I have to know. So you couldn't think your way out of it. And what the, the interesting thing is, what they found, the second order effect was, and it is a quote from Steven Spears, they found uh, pockets of ignorance. You know what? In, in other words, they became a learning in, in that learning organization. And so, like, I don't care if you put a human card on. I don't care if you base, like, like, become a learning organization, whatever way it takes. And O'Neill did it. Uh, Gene has a great write-up on this in the DevOps blog. Um, I am John Willis, Batsakaloop, and uh, again, all these presentations, because this one is on the using the IE and all of that. Thank you very much. For
that was a great presentation by John.